in print is long, is uh, deep, but uh, you know, I, I people ask me, Karch, I know that name. Who is it? I go, oh, that's easy. He's the best volleyball player ever that ever walked the earth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really simple. You know, the most successful, the most proficient player that the world has ever known. It's a real easy way to categorize them. <laughs> yeah, so true. So true. Well, to everybody that's listening in, um, we are about ready to start in about a minute or so, and and we'll give you some pointers here. When, uh, well, actually, we'll start giving you the pointers now. You're the early bird. You get the worm, you guys out there. So, there's a question in a chat box. Uh, you can ask questions during the recording of Tom. I'm the moderator, so I got to kind of say I'm going to save that one. I'll probably type back to you. I'm going to save that one to the end for Tom, or I'll ask it of Tom as this slideshow kind of goes through. So, Because um, we are lucky to have the captain of our gold medal team um, here to join us tonight. So we, uh, we've got about 20 people on now, and it's 6.30. So Tom, I think uh, even though it's morning in Malaysia for Auckland, we we'll, I think we're going to get started um, with all the stuff that you know, we'd like to share about you. So uh, those of you that don't know what Tom looks like up close and personal, whether he's holding a big trophy, what is that a World League trophy or what do you got there? World. Yeah, that's the uh, World League to yeah, trophy from 2008. So. And I've, you know, been fortunate to spend some time with Tom both on and away from the court, and, and uh, he's a great ambassador for the sport, not to mention the fact that he's, doing some great stuff for Special Olympics. Uh, what were you, like two days after surgery and you're out there with your arm in a huge sling and you're still helping all those Special Olympians when we were back at the uh, National Championships in Lincoln in 2010? But, oh, that was a uh, yeah, terrific opportunity. Obviously, um, the uh, shoulder surgery wasn't conducive for it, but you know what? There was a uh, great opportunity to... Uh, interact with a lot of uh, other great athletes, so I uh, had to go and had to, uh, had to participate, So, and I was happy to. It was, it was a fantastic event. And now it's, did you go to Worlds, too? Yes, I was in the uh, World Games in Athens. Yeah, Athens. so you went to Athens. Sweet. Yep. Sweet. So from Lincoln to Athens, yeah, that's a, that's a step up. <laughs> well, sure. um, let's learn a little about Tom here, and he's going to do most of the talking. Uh, I just have to say on this next slide, I love your middle name. It's just a great middle name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, here we go. We're going to get going on the on the slides for Tom. So this is your bio. Um, what the heck are you doing being 6'6"? Six, six? What's your parents? Are you, they both pretty tall or something? You know, actually, uh, this is that bio is probably filled out at least around my height was filled out, uh, boy, probably in one of my earliest uh, USA developmental teams. And I tried to get this changed for so many years. And throughout my, that height has followed me 198 centimeters. I'm actually 6'8", I'm a little over 6'8", actually. And uh, so when I would compete in international tournaments, as my career went on, this height actually followed me into the FIVB. And people always were commenting that I was, kind of an undersized middle that could compete on that stage, which uh, was fairly amusing. I kept trying to tell people, I'm actually 6'8", so, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, so. My, actually, I am a, uh, I am a, an anomaly in my family. No one else is, uh, uh, happens to be tall. My dad is about six feet. My mom is 5'9", uh, so huh. uh, I had a, a pretty interesting uh, experience of wishing myself in, uh, to be roughly about 6'6", six, six, actually, when I was uh, 16 years old after um, learning and reading about the, uh, the Olympic team in 88. And I was saying, boy, I'm only six feet tall, and the, the one thing I see that's common amongst all these guys is they're, I was looking at the uh, gold medal roster, these guys are 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. You know, I saw you know, guys even 6'7", I go, I'm going to have to grow, you know, at least to be that tall and literally put my mind to it, and sure enough, about two years later, I graduated school at uh, about six, 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 seven. <laughs> so you ate your Wheaties. Hey, um, what is it in centimeters? I'm going to make sure it gets fixed. 204. 204. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Been a lot of time in Europe, so everyone always comes <laughs> asking, are you really 198? I said, no. 
All right. Um, we're going to do a quick couple polls for all of our sake. Um, we want to uh, get a sense of, um, uh, let me find my options here, what I've done with the poll. There it is. So we're going to manage the polls, and we're going to launch the first poll. Um, oops. That's not what I wanted. What am I doing at GoToMeeting? <laughs> what the heck? I just want a poll. Uh, well, I think I may have blown the polls in, so let's uh, let's move on to the next um, slide where we start to learn a little about your college background. Before we leave the slide, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Yeah, I was actually born um, outside Chicago. I was born in a uh, northwest suburbs called Park Ridge, Illinois. So uh, obviously it's a, uh, a town back when I was growing up in an area where um, it was uh, fairly difficult fairly difficult for me to find uh, a lot of volleyball. And I was actually introduced to the game um, by my brother and sister in a co-ed uh, adult rec league actually down in the in the city called a place called the Armory in Chicago and uh, quite memorable because I was doing a, fair, a number of other sports basketball track and field um, and soccer throughout my early years and as soon as I got introduced to the game through that one night down at the Armory in Chicago I literally you know and I remember speaking to my parents I, I pretty much dropped everything and started to uh, learn and discover all the various opportunities at YMCA's or grass or makeshift beach courts all around uh, the city of Chicago, whether it was out in Indiana, up in Wisconsin, out in Chicago, in the suburbs, uh, all the places I had to go to to, uh, you know, kind of satiate my uh, my love for the game that I was uh, just starting out. And I, and I literally couldn't couldn't get enough of it. I was playing every single day and knew where to go all around the city. Isn't that cool? I, you know, I had the same sort of feeling when, when I discovered the game, but I was talking with Matt McShane, you know, the coach at Air Force now, and he was saying how we figured in the a year we didn't play Christmas and Easter. Otherwise, we played at least two hours every day. And it sounds like you were doing the same amount of play all you can, you know, like no matter who it was against, you just had to play. I remember telling my parents on, on Christmas, uh, I would be watching the NBA games, I said, boy, would I love to be playing volleyball somehow, some way on Christmas. And uh, eventually I did get that to uh, become a reality, and that was after I uh, came out here uh, to California and started to go to school out here. And sure enough, I'd be calling my parents um, on Christmas or, or Easter. There was no day uh, that I didn't want to get out and play some sort of organized <laughs> games, whether it was indoor or on the beach, so. That's cool. All right, all right, I found the poll, so we're going to just learn a little about the group that's on. Um, the poll just sort of jumps up, and you should be looking at it right now. And you know, it's just sort of click all that apply. Um, and then when it comes up, I'll both uh, Tom and I will have a chance to see, you know, what everybody is. So far, um, we've got some club directors. Okay, it's coming in pretty fast now. Um, a third of them have voted, and the only, you know, the fascinating things right now, 0% junior boys coach. <laughs> so, listen hey, the, to fact that, the fact that it's even a checkbox is, you know, uh, beautiful <laughs> for me to see because back, you know, back when I was growing up, uh, I couldn't find uh, a full team of guys, boys to play with, and, and obviously I've been back since and been to JOs and it, it makes me extremely happy to see so many uh, young boys being introduced to the game and, and playing the game. Yeah, and, and this weekend coming up, uh, Andy is heading out to the D3 Nationals. And, of course, that's the first boys sport that, or men's sport, I should say, that's been added to the NC2A roster of championship matches since uh, 1984. And, and the first one's going to be taking place, so that's pretty cool. All right, we've got enough people that have voted. Let's uh, show you who they are and kind of what they're, you know, what they're thinking about. Um, there, you've got mostly, you know, mostly girls coaches, and mm -hmm. luckily though, quite a bit are doing youth, which is great. It's fantastic. That's great. We like we like the youth side of things. For yeah. sure. And then we had, uh, I think, one other question, um, although I don't. 
Yeah, I don't see it jumping back on, so we don't need to do that one. All right, let's move on and talk college, which is the next slide coming up. Um, and to everybody listening, you can ask questions, and I'll either hold them or uh, ask them directly. Uh, we do have a Q&A open line type at the end of this for Tom. So uh, if you see any questions, you can type them into the question or the chat box, and I'll save them or relay them right now. So, so Yeah, I'll... I'll, I'll I'll echo that sentiment too, John. I would love to uh, understand, you know, what everyone would love for uh, kind of feedback or lines of uh, discussion. Obviously, um, uh, I'd be more than happy to interact as much as possible with uh, with everybody on the line here. Yeah, and hopefully, with all the questions about, you know, your favorite quote and what's your book, we can learn a little bit more, <laughs> more about Tom. <laughs> oh man, the embarrassing stuff. So, so from a Buckeye to the coast, what was that about? Yeah, I actually, um, uh, out of high school uh, in Park Ridge, um, obviously I knew I wanted to uh, put myself in a place where I could challenge myself as a volleyball player and was a little bit unsure at uh, my level and how I would uh, interact with the various players around the country. My only um, exposure to other boys playing the game was at a JO's event uh, in Tampa, and that was my very first one, and it was a little bit challenging for me because the team we were on uh, we weren't as uh, we weren't as uh, let's say qualified at the game and as experienced as a lot of the teams one of the teams we played was uh, a team out of Southern California out of Huntington Beach and we absolutely got just smashed and I was thinking boy if this is the type of quality of, of players that I've got to put myself up against it's going to be a, uh, a long road of, of training but I knew I wanted to put myself in, in some challenging environment uh, for school and uh, volleyball, and that place for me was uh, Ohio State, uh, the Ohio State University. And I uh, absolutely loved the school, uh, had a great time there, um, really uh, thought that I, I would love to try to stay at the school, but uh, over time I started to, um, I had a, a thought, my parents I would call uh, my parents and talked to them how, how was discussions around how was the school going obviously I was a mechanical engineering uh, major and I was doing good in school and I kept telling the one thing that was uh, irking me that was troublesome was that um, I, I really wanted to be uh, I had this expression that I used to tell them I wanted to be the worst player on the court you know I didn't want to be the guy who was uh, kind of leading um, in the experience level and I wanted to be constantly challenged from that aspect and I said I feel like I, I need to put myself in kind of a different environment and uh, over two years I played at Ohio State I ended up um, making the choice to put myself at the transfer over actually to Long Beach State uh, number one obviously it had a uh, another program obviously that I could pursue my academic interests of uh, mechanical engineering and then Along with that, um, it, it, I was in probably the heart or the mecca of um, all these players that I emulated as a kid and looked in the magazine and followed from USA Volleyball, uh, from the national teams and the Olympic teams. Um, this is where they were born, raised, trained out in uh, you know Southern California is where I where I knew them all to be from, and I and I just kept saying to myself, this is this is the area that I have to immerse myself in. Uh, because there's such a high concentration of quality uh, university programs, you know, that were currently yeah. out in uh, California. And yet, there you are. The Buckeyes, of course, won the uh, NC2A title with Pete for the first time. Pete, by the way, was a partner. I, he and I played together uh, both doubles and um, six on six in, in 19, I think it was 77, when he was out at the University of Wyoming with Jim Stone coaching. But that aside, I'm looking here, 490 kills ranked third all-time in Buckeye history, and you're only there two years? Uh, yeah, I, don't know the, I don't know the statistics exactly, but, you know, I, I really uh, enjoyed my time with Pete. I thought, uh, coaching-wise, I think he's fantastic. I'd love to see that. I think a lot of that college uh, men's parity has really uh, pushed – uh, all over the country, which is, I think, great for the sport. There's a lot more opportunities for uh, boys to take advantage and, and create more opportunities for themselves to uh, 
uh, get a great education and then also continue their uh, passion for playing the game. So, uh, but you know, back when I was growing up, you really, if you wanted to excel, it was uh, being out in the West Coast gave you the highest chance for success. And I ended up making that decision to transfer. Interesting. And yet in two years, then you became fifth in career kills and second in kills per game. I mean, that's 6.54. That's, that's a pretty, that's a pretty high rate. And that's all out of the middle. John, I was a very, very good friends with my setters over all the years. It was <laughs> one, of, one of the most important things. Anytime they ever wanted to work on setting, uh, as, uh, as a middle, I always got on the court and said, oh, sure, I'll work on some quicks with you. <laughs> never turn, you never turn on the uh, setters or the passers. You always complimented them uh, at the <laughs> utmost and helped them out with their game. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of wisdom right there. I mean, you could wrap up this <laughs> webinar now, and you'll be better <laughs> out there. For sure. That's great. I love it. <laughs> so are you using your degree at all? Uh, interesting question. My, uh, my current job that I'm uh, working for right now is a predictive analytics software company. So it's not mechanical engineering per se, but it's a, a very complex technical uh, sales environment of a, a software that actually um, I was at a sales call up in a, a large healthcare uh, institution today up in LA, and someone happened to bring it up. They saw me on LinkedIn, and they said, "How the heck is an Olympian? What are they doing at prediction software?" And the the synopsis is that when I was a player, I leveraged statistics and uh, players and rotations and uh, the ability to look at a team and see the rotation they're in and kind of feel what. Uh, how we could be successful as a team if we, in what areas of the court they were going to attack us or hurt us in, in certain rotations and certain times of the games, uh, and then also certain players, what they like to do when uh, in, incredible, uh, critical, or pressure kind of oriented uh, situations. So the similar, the parallel to my job right now is we have a software company that has leverages business statistics to enhance future outcomes, future decisions. So it's a uh, it's kind of a parallel environment. And uh, so in, in short, yes, I am using my engineering uh, degree. So I'm extremely uh, happy I pursued it throughout the years. Well, obviously, you're uh, in the top percent of uh, IQ. And, and I'd say that's one of the coolest things about your 04 and 08 um, success was your volleyball IQ that you kept carrying forward even from the sideline as captain and not necessarily on the court. That was always a delight to see. Yeah, um, and uh, you know, when I talk to kids, they um, inherently start out conversations around, boy, you're 6'8", or you jump real high and could hit hard. And uh, I realized pretty, pretty early on in my career that I was not um, – my physical attributes that I could bring to the team were not a difference maker. They weren't the, the biggest value that I could add to the team. But, you know, I learned that for me to be um, add a lot to our success as a team was the ability to, uh, like you're saying, bring this IQ and uh, apply it to the game and apply it to us as a kind of a team dynamics and team strategy, which I think you know a lot of our, our coaches really embrace and push upon and obviously together, I think we we took advantage of a lot of uh, situations and statistics and in volleyball situations due to our uh, the volleyball IQ we carried around. Yeah. So the photo of the 2004 team is up. And since you're 6'8", obviously Ryan is 6'9", and so is Loyal Ball. Um, <laughs> Gabe must be 6'10"? Something like that, yeah. And, and obviously that's a, a nice picture to say that... Uh, there's a lot of guys uh, who competed at that level, who uh, would put themselves at uh, compete at the world level for volleyball players. Being six eight is not one of those differentiators. You really had to uh, apply your mind to the game, which I thought was a very unique attribute that we, as a team, collectively uh, applied for uh, you know a direct access to our success. Yeah. And then it looks like that's Phil Etherton with his long hair version, right? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> uh, we got to send him a picture of that. I'd love to see, <laughs> <laughs> see what he thinks of that. Yeah, there's a lot of other tall guys out there. That's for sure. Yeah. 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 One of the things I one of the things I try to uh, impress upon kids is they ask a lot who is the tallest guy you played against or the highest jumper. Uh, and the biggest thing I, I told them when I go to tournaments, World Cups or World Championships, Olympic Games, uh, the players that I uh, paid the most attention to were not any of those guys. The guys who could control the ball, both from a passing, from a setting, from a hitting standpoint, the ability to limit their errors and really change kind of the dynamics of the teams and, and have a grasp on uh, what was going on uh, kind of on a momentum side for, for teams were the guys that I paid the most attention to. They were the guys that really could, uh, you know, cause us the most frustration and the ability for us to be successful. The guys who jumped high and hit straight down in warm-ups, you know, we usually look past and, and focus our efforts on other guys. It's interesting you say that because when, um, when number eight, you know, was uh, Reed was much, much younger, you know, you saw some great athleticism. You guys were in Colorado Springs at the time, of course, and, you know, did some clinics for boys and girls around here, and he certainly has grown into being, I think, one of those smaller but amazingly error-free players that carries a load, at, at least at the outside. Oh, absolutely, and I, I vividly have memories of Reed first coming in Sports Center 1 in Colorado Springs. Um, and a young kid from LMU who was literally flying around the gym with an arm like a like a lightning bolt. But um, what we needed at the time or what we needed in his position was a guy, exactly what you're saying, guys who made very, very little hitting errors or took the, the ability to pick and choose times uh, to take chances. And as a player, he relied a lot in his early years on – his unique ability that the big man has granted him with his physical dynamics that he brought to the team. And obviously those are something that even on the world stage, he separates himself from, you know, the very cream of the crop up there. But, you know, as he got later on in his career and got the amount of repetitions and saw the game at, at a highest level, yes, he is uh, a premier player in that ability that he has those physical attributes to bring. And then he also has the ability that he's, extremely, extremely consistent um, and has very little flaws into his game. Cool. Um, we do have another question that makes sense to ask here. Um, shed some light on Riley site, uh, Riley's journey to uh, the national team. Um, on, on What was the question? To on Riley, Riley yeah, uh, number 10. Yep. Um, yeah, he was a guy who uh, I knew early on when he first joined the team, and um, uh, obviously he was later on in, in 2008. We were extremely close um, uh, on our as co-captains of the team, and I think he played a very huge, impactful role for us on the court. Um, much to the lines of what you're saying, he was as consistent as anything. He controlled the ball like nobody else in the world. Um, he also had this confidence that I saw as a, as a very young player when he came into the gym that he truly believed that with the ball in his hands, you know, or at the end of his hand hitting or passing at the end of a game at the most critical moments, he was always uberly confident that he wanted to get the ball delivered to him. And he exuded that confidence, obviously, to the Libros that he played with, the other outside hitters that he played with. He made other players such uh, such more effective passers and then gave the setters incredible confidence that if there is a ball that they were in trouble with that he knew that he wouldn't take a bad, maybe a bad swing at it if we were in trouble. He would take a very smart, uh, tactful swing at the, maybe to get the ball back and for us to transition. So he was a uh, obviously a, a guy that came out of kind of nowhere. He didn't have the traditional um, Division One college uh, upbringing that a lot of uh, the pedigree from a lot of our players kind of get built out of uh, from the college programs, but I think through his you know battle hardening from from kind of running through a different 
upbringing through that, uh, you know, the JC and, and not playing in Division One really kept the chip on the show that the guy worked as hard as anybody in the gym that I've ever played with. And uh, I really enjoyed training with the guy. He was wow. as intense and as confident as ever. Great, great, great stuff and great examples. All right, a couple of more sort of fun slides, and then we get into the skills. Um, what's this all about, the Today Show, 2004, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah, that was a, uh, uh, a, a fantastic uh, uh, opportunity for the guys um, after we meet. In 2004, obviously, a lot of people asked, did we win a medal? soon after and it was um, you know unfortunately that we get that question a lot um, and I, I tell people quite candidly we did not uh, we weren't successful in bringing home a medal but the one thing we did do as, as a team and uh, we were part of uh, this monumental comeback against the Greeks in uh, Athens that I'm extremely proud of being a part of that USA Volleyball uh, tradition of never ever giving up we were down uh, 20 to 11 in the fourth game against about 20,000 other Greek fans playing against the Greek team that uh, in the fourth game decided that they thought they already won the match. So that was a, a actually a, a really great memory that uh, I have with the guys. And um, that, that day soon after, yeah, we got to get on with uh, Katie Couric and the Today Show. It was a great opportunity for the guys. And tomorrow we're 100 days out from London, and we'll be uh, having – some beach volleyball and some sitting volleyball actually um, going on in New York and a lot of uh, hype on NBC again. So your tradition continues. Um, he's obviously uh, not too tall. <laughs> so. No, no, that's for sure. It was, yeah, it, it was a, a great opportunity to grow the game and um, introduce the game to a lot of people. Obviously, being on the Today Show was, was the best thing. And uh, really look back is, is fond memories and ability to, yeah, there's a, a nice indication of how uh, challenged she is in height. But, yeah, really nice person and, and glad we got to be, uh, uh, get a lot of other people introduced to the game that normally don't know about too much about volleyball in the Olympics. So, cool. All right. We're going to get started. Uh, you know, the two skills you're obviously best known for, you're hitting and blocking. So, we've got about a half a dozen slides of each skill and, and, you know, this is just sort of free form. Your thoughts into hitting is what we'll go with first. Um, after a, a little brief memory story, if you will, please, about this picture, which is fairly historic. Yeah, it um, still brings a, a, a grand smile to my face to see um, really a small collection of, of people uh, who were really part of this bigger movement obviously there's so many people in each one of the guys that you see in, the, in that picture who gave up a lot their families and friends uh, supported over the years uh, you know I see coaches who have if, if I was an old player there's guys who have coached the game for you know much longer than myself and gave back a ton to the game of volleyball um, that is a just a fantastic memory that got snapped in time that um, uh, always appreciate to see you know it's great to see what a collection of uh, people can do when they put their mind completely uh, to one single-minded goal, uh, and, and ours was uh, to become best in the world at the 2008 Games. And uh, you know, I, I give a lot, a big credit to Hugh. He four years ago from this picture, he uh, put it upon us that we were going to vocalize that and communicate that and put it out to the world. And uh, that's a nice. Uh, that's a nice reminder of what it takes and all the time and effort, not only for the guys in the picture, but all the other people who supported us along the way. You don't look too uh, happy there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a lot more uh, celebrating in the in our raising number ones, and uh, yeah, yeah, really great, to, great to experience that with all the guys and obviously the staff, and we had a lot of great uh, support obviously over the years from not only USA Volleyball but the USOC and to celebrate with all of the support people uh, both in Beijing and when we came home uh, was uh, a really fantastic uh, experience. You know, I, I have to ask this question because, you know, Hugh had the tragedy and you were captain of this group of guys that 
didn't have their head coach, um, which is not what normally happens when you enter into any tournament at any level. How did you uh, deal with that as captain? Um, you know, I think one of the uh, strongest characteristics, uh, I've always been fascinated by leadership, the ability for uh, guys, coaches, people like you, uh, their ability to kind of move people and change and, and, and uh, influence people who uh, maybe have been successful in their own right, whether it's at colleges or from coaches as athletes on their club teams, you know, and really take that and uh, put that into an area, take all these personalities and put them together to really affect people um, and point them to some goal and, and make sure that they give up a little bit of themselves for this greater good of the team. And I think, especially from Hugh, that, that one characteristic that I, that really uh, exacerbated itself in Beijing was the ability that as great leaders you want things to run when you're not there. I mean, that is the, I think, kind of the true uh, pillar of, of a true leader is you want this to run uh, without your presence and he prepared us for that time and gave us ownership and made sure that we were challenged uh, throughout the years of, of taking responsibility and ownership of what we were going to do on the court uh, during these uh, matches here in Beijing and obviously he wasn't able uh, to be with us for the first couple but uh, a true um, you know indication of what he did for us in the realm of uh, you know Stepping up and, and owning our owning what we're going to do on those in the court, you know, many years ago. So, you know, elaborate a little tiny bit more about gave us ownership, Tom, because that is a you know this the tradition in our sport and not just our sport, but like basketball, the coach is so active and involved and screaming and yelling and doing all these things, and kids will shank in volleyball and turn their head immediately to the coach for the answer and things like that. How did, uh, how did practice go for you so that you were being empowered, the players were being empowered in, in learning that stuff? How, how was that happening maybe differently from high school or, or whatever? You know, Hugh actually, I guess, would identify, and not just Hugh, the rest of our staff, but he really put it upon us to showcase here are areas where um, we can apply ourselves and if we can hit certain numbers and limiting our errors and passing a certain number and hitting a transition numbers, you know, attainable, reachable um, goals that we could set out for ourselves um, from kind of a statistics point in volleyball, that if we could knock down these, that we had a very, very high, high probability of being successful against teams over the long term and over in, in tournaments like in Beijing. It didn't involve, he, he always made it a point that there were no, uh, this is an extra special point, you know, he made it like if it was 0-0 zero, zero to 23 all, it did not matter. We still played the game kind of with a sense of urgency that if we got in a situation where uh, we got a soft block that the whole team knew that the ability for us to score a point in transition uh, was a very strong indicator of us uh, being successful in matches. If we could turn many of those, that was almost like the building blocks. Those were the baby steps that we could take to knowing that we could be successful in the match. So uh, obviously throughout my time uh, competing, a lot of people say they want to win. Uh, there's a lot of players and a lot of coaches that say, oh, I, I would, I'd love to win more than anybody. Um, the people who truly walk that walk want to do all the things that uh, happen uh, outside these Olympic Games or outside the competition. They want to do it. Um, for us, that was like Monday morning, 9 a.m. when we were in practices. Um, it was when there was no lights on, when there was no crowds, when there was no cameras, when there was nobody doing webinars and interviews and stuff. Uh, that work and that ability that you own the results, and we did as a team and as a staff, and uh, you know, as as the USA team, we owned our results from that sense. So uh, we did that uh, well away from the shine of the lights of uh, the Beijing Olympics. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Time to talk hitting and volleyball. We've gone a half hour of this kind of fun stuff, and I appreciate that. that I'm learning stuff, Tom. I, <laughs> I really am. Here we go with your thoughts on this thing called hitting. 
Excellent. Well, obviously, this is uh, uh, probably the favorite skill um, for kids to uh, be introduced to the game. And obviously, as I talk about it, I would love to hear if, if uh, the, the audience had some kind of point questions they'd love to for me to address more specifically in hitting, what areas, whether it uh, about the approach. Um, hitting is about, and you'll probably hear me resonate this with a lot of the skills in volleyball, but it's uh, a lot about doing everything almost before your hand hits the ball and preparing yourself to be successful on that. Number one skill for me is just tracking the ball with your eyes, is knowing where it's going on the court and reacting to uh, Uh oh. Where'd you go, Thomas? Yeah, Tom, we've lost you. Um, hmm. I know that he went to actually the landline and called in, so. Uh, Let's let's just sort of wait here and see if he can sign back on. Um, uh, with him missing, I'm gonna fast forward. Hopefully, Tom, you can. Uh, I don't know, Andy. What do you think we can do to bring him back? Is there anything we can do? I'm gonna send another audio pin to him. See if that'll work because he still shows up as a panelist. He just, boom, just went off. I, don't um, know, I, get, I get disconnected. I apologize. Can you hear me, John? Yeah, I can. All right. Well, I just sent him that. Um, we'll go past the hitting blocking that he was going to do. and. John, can you hear me? Yeah, is that you, Tom? Yep. That's me. Okay. All right. Yeah, sorry. I got, I got disconnected. Okay, glad you're back. We're, we'll get back to your slides. <laughs> All right. Okay. Welcome back. Um, yeah, no problem. Um, I, what I was saying, I don't know where I got cut off. I think hitting has a lot to do. A lot of people say, you know, how do I hit the ball? How do I, as a more successful hitter, uh, I really look at all the steps that happen before the ball is actually on your hand and moving to the other side of the net. And the number one kind of skill in that is your eyes and tracking the ball from the moment it starts to cross over the net from the service standpoint. And then for the ability then to put yourself in a position where you can always, as a middle, it was always be available no matter where the ball gets past you, whether it's a perfect pass, obviously, 90% uh, of the players can always approach and be there. As a middle, it was what if the ball was pushed way to the left or way to the right? If you did not do a lot of work before the ball was delivered to the setter in putting yourself, kind of working yourself into the middle of the court, obviously you had a much harder time uh, to draw attention and be in, an ability, be in a position to actually uh, be a threat that uh, as a middle is, you know, the number one uh, first uh, threat of a team that kind of sets up the offensive rhythm. So if we as middles were not effective in, positioning ourselves as the ball was coming over on serve receive, getting in the middle of the court to be able to hit a 31, maybe a front one or a back one, uh, you were really uh, uh, lacking the inability to, to remain a threat on the very first course of action for an offense. All right, well, Jason's got a question. We'll throw it at you right now. Uh, Tom, do you get specific with the height of contact? Uh, do you emphasize hitting when the body is just before? Before its height, hitting at height, younger players struggle with falling too far, not preparing the arm early enough, and then hit what we call negatively or on the way down. Yeah, and that's a obviously that's a, a great question. And if you you know the physics of it, obviously is uh, you want to the topic maybe what he's trying to address there is uh, from a timing perspective. The ability to be in your approach in, uh, as a hitter, you want to be able to wait to the last possible second and approaching with such uh, velocity that you're, you know exactly where the ball height is and you're approaching with the velocity to get yourself off the ground and hit it at the absolute 
tight and giving yourself kind of uh, the physical levers uh, that produce range. And that's obviously if you touch nine feet and you're always hitting the ball at nine feet, uh, imagine the angles then you can hit. Obviously, if you go down to eight feet, the ball gets the only ways that you're going to kill the ball is uh, at a much flatter trajectory. You know, you lose the ability to actually physically hit areas of the court. And so that makes your range smaller. Um, so the answer to his question, timing for young kids uh, to understand when should I approach. And by the way, you don't want them approaching kind of at a half speed because that obviously uh, lacks them the ability to uh, add the energy to get off the ground. You know, efficient hitters have this tendency to wait to the last possible moment and then approach with great velocity to transmit all that momentum or energy from running towards the net to bounding off the ground, to translating that all into kind of vertical energy to get them as high as possible and take the ball at its absolute peak that you can. And did you find it easier? This is uh, one of the more fascinating things, coaching younger kids. Um, I've always taught the first ball you should learn to hit is a meter ball. And then as you get better, higher and higher sets because it's easier to do the timing as a young player because the ball's not falling through the hitting zone as much or as fast, I should say. Um, how did you feel like you became such a versatile middle hitter? Yeah, um, that's obviously a, a, a good question. And to going back to the point for kids being introduced to it, obviously if they're going to be hitting a ball that's 30 or 40 feet thrown in the air, by the time it gets down to their hitting range at nine feet, the ball's traveling extremely fast in its descent. So the the easiest thing for kids to hit a ball is when it hangs in the air at near around its peak, right around where they can hit the ball out of the air. So the higher you toss it above, let's say a kid who can touch uh, nine feet, the faster that ball will drop through their hitting zone. Uh, so as a coach, you kind of want to learn to toss or have setters set a ball that almost hangs right around their peak jump where their arm is totally extended where they're getting off the ground. Um, you know, as a middle hitter, uh, you know, the most, the number one thing to, to like I said, to focus on is obviously uh, being up and available, being a threat every single time from the very first point and back when we were playing rally score, it was three and a half hours later. Uh, the 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 best middles uh, offensively were the guys who were consistently always there every time. And from a number-wise, a statistic-wise, traditionally middles don't take a lot of, uh, don't incorporate a large percentage of the amount of uh, attacks, but they're extremely high in their efficiency. So every time the ball does get hit off your hand, you're going to have a free, very frequent time to get a kill. And obviously you use that to your advantage to say um, what we did later on is we you would set other people when a perfect, perfect ball went up. A lot of teams had a tendency to jump on a commit, we call it. And we as a team uh, identified this, and obviously Loy is uh, the best uh, you know that I've seen that on perfect balls, he was an absolute nightmare in – the ability to stop our middles because they were consistently up on time and we had so many of us available options because they, our middles were always up and on time no matter if we pass the ball maybe left to center or far left to center or to the right to center. Uh, they always put in a, themselves in an area and a position on the court where they could be a, an offensive threat. And with Lloyd, he could throw it in from you know, 10, 15 feet off the net from just about anywhere, you, you had to you had to be extremely cautious uh, with him as a, a opposing blocker. Very, very well said. Um, Chang's got a question worth asking right now. I think uh, with today's youth spending less time throwing balls, uh, what are your thoughts on teaching proper arm swing mechanics? How are you going to teach your 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 children? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And the interesting thing about this is. Uh, as professional volleyball players, we spend a lot of time outside the U.S. Here, there's no professional leagues here in the U.S., so 
I have seen a lot of other athletes in a lot of other countries where throwing the ball, where throwing the ball like we traditionally do a lot is with a football or with a baseball, which is where you see a lot of uh, youth arms get developed. Uh, there is, they don't have that, but they have volleyball players with incredible uh, dynamic and accurate and controlled arm swings. So I don't really, uh, I don't believe in the justification that if someone's got a good arm from baseball or from football, that that translates into volleyball. I've seen plenty of guys that are world-class hitters who have the utmost control to dial up speed and direction and change course of, of the ball. But if you gave them a football, um, frankly, it's, it's quite embarrassing to see a world-class <laughs> athlete who can't, who can't throw a ball. Like we would normally say it looks like an, that guy looks like an athlete. He's got a great arm. Um, it, it's a, a skill, obviously, that, again, I, an arm swing is developed from a lot of work that happens before your hand hits the ball. If your feet aren't under you, you're not in the position where the ball is, you're, you're, you can have the greatest arm swing, but if you're if sitting off to your side, as you can kind of see in this picture here, imagine if the ball was uh, a foot or two off the center of my body or on top of my head, all of a sudden it makes it much more difficult uh, for my arm swing to be effective. So I believe a ton in uh, all the work and all the prep, body prep and uh, what happens you know, I will, I'll watch kids when they play the game. What happens before they put their hand on the ball? I necessarily, when I watch younger kids play the game, I don't really watch the ball too much. I can hear it if they hit it well or they hit it solidly. I don't watch if it goes in or out. I can then ask immediately and, and engage in uh, someone who just hit a ball and say, what did that feel like? Did it feel good? Don't concentrate on the result when uh, they're just being introduced to the game. It's They have to recognize wow, I was, you know, that was a great timing. I positioned myself. I prepped myself to be in the middle of the court. There's so many great precursors to focus kids on that happen before they hit the ball and or was that ball in or out by two or three inches. And what I told our guys, even in our gym, there's so many ways you can affect that outcome without worrying. If that's one of the things you're going to worry about, that better be issue number 9 or 19 or 99. There's so many other things that you should be thinking about uh, to put yourself in that opportunity to pass the ball to, uh, you know, how was my timing and how did I communicate to my teammates. So um, when you're coaching, it's I, I really believe in a lot of stuff happens before uh, you actually put your hand on the ball. So to that end, um, Michael Marceau asks, uh, in juniors, how do you correct a goofy-footed approach, or do you? Yeah, that's a uh, another interesting topic. We here in the U.S. are very, um, uh, I guess, strict with we need to correct it. I've seen some um, incredible volleyball players who are goofy-footed. I think it's very difficult to continually train someone who's goofy-footed because uh, the lack of the ability for them to see someone like, who looks like them, who can approach like them at an effective level. I, I didn't know a guy in the U.S. who played at international level um, for uh, boy, all the years that I played on the national team who, who was goofy-footed, yet uh, there was a guy on the 96 Netherlands team, a middle uh, held, who was a phenomenal, uh, potent offensive threat. But um, what I would say is if my kids were goofy-footed, I would uh, definitely, the younger they are, I'd work to change it. I wouldn't necessarily work to change a, a, maybe a, a high school senior who's still goofy-footed and uh, fairly successful or confident and enjoying the game at that level. Um, my thought on how to best change goofy foot is to um, side by side, almost like mirroring and, and really reducing a lot of the speed, almost like dance steps, you know, putting your feet just doing a basic approach really slow and repeating it over and over and over. And every time they do it correctly, really emphasizing to get their brain to think, how did that feel? Did you feel that? It, that, you know, that it, the approach was different. And I've worked with a couple kids out here actually at, at a, a club that it's very difficult for kids to uh, 
do that concept in, in approach kind of in a regular manner, non-goofy footed, and then once all the chaos of the actual playing of a, of a volleyball game or a scrimmage or a practice, once all these other factors get thrown in, they forget that they can't rely on that um, you know that uh, mechanism in their mind that re that remembers reminds them how how did this, how did that feel to do it and really repetition in non stressful non uh, time constrained environments I think is the key to doing it when there's not a lot of people watching I'd pull the guys out 10 15 minutes before the practice and just say let's go over just some basic approaches where every every single time we approach it's going to be perfect. Now, I'm not saying every time we're going to touch 11-6 or something, but I'm going to say every time I am watching only their feet, and I want their footwork to be extremely efficient, extremely uh, effective, and uh, no lost steps or extra shuffle steps, really effective footwork. So repetition, reduce the speed, reduce a lot of the other factors for them with other players on the court or and then having to work on timing is, I think, a, a nice uh, first step in, in trying to correct someone who's goofy-footed. You know, and I'll add my two cents here, Tom. Um, Mar Michael, I think uh, I see a lot of people practice looking at their feet or looking at the net when every time you hit, you're looking up for the ball unless you're – a middle like Tom and already in the air before the ball's even been set, you know, and it's coming to you and you've already taken off. For those outside hitters that often have goofy-footed approaches, you need to practice looking up where you're going to be seeing the ball or else, as you were saying, this kinesthetic awareness doesn't happen. You, you see it and you think you know what you're doing, then when you go back to looking up for the ball, you can't feel it the right way because we look at our feet or the net. I also would sort of echo the same thing about uh, there are players that are Olympians with medals that are goofy footed. And what we, the reason it's not something we want to see out of really strong players is because you, you, your finishing left right turns you towards the net, turns you and closes you off to your center and starts you on that torque move towards the net. And we see those players then twisted down the line trying to hit cross court and they hit them with kind of more of a cut shot or a wrist away shot that over repetitive times causes some problems and if they can take off even goofy footed but open up and really torque in the air and get back to more of a neutral shot so they can hit cross court which is what some of these Olympians do so well it's not even a goofy footed approach anymore because it's not causing them to be twisted now the high school level, I tell you, that twist that way, they start hitting down the line and hitting off the block down the line. And some of the younger, smaller players are pretty effective with that goofy-footed approach. That's why they like it. So let's get one more question as I and then we're, uh, go to another tipping shot uh, coming up. But um, Jason asks, why don't we see more men's international teams use a slide or a step around at all? Um, I assume. Uh, he means backslide. Yeah, I think that's what he means, John. Yeah, I do. Uh -huh. Yeah, it, in one of the reasons uh, uh, we don't, you don't see a step around in um, international play is if we can look right here at this picture, um, we generate a lot of our efficient kills by um, pressuring this. What we saw is pressuring the right side blocker as much as possible. The ability for me to run behind uh, and not initiate someone to actually move into the middle of the court or make the middle react and move to the left because the time out of the setter's hands into the ball is struck. You know, in this situation, I think it's a, a 31. Loy is probably right out of the picture here. Um, the the back slide or um, the, 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 traditionally a lot of women's teams run it. Um, is a, a little slower to develop, and with men being so, with uh, boys uh, being a little more physical, it's a little bit easier to uh, react to that play. And the second reason, uh, speaking to international play, is because we had a, uh, a behemoth monster named Clay Stanley who is on the right side of the court there who could hit the ball about 120 miles an hour 
off his hand and and take people's arms and heads and <laughs> off. Uh, and so what we knew as a team is you never wanted, to, for the most part, to drag people over into his area. He was uh, traditionally opposites in the world hit a slower ball. So if you had two players who were both hitting slower sets out of the same kind of area of the net, you had the ability to have a team load up on uh, to react back to that one area. So, um, you know, for us, you definitely didn't want to drag a slower set over to a guy who hits a little bit higher uh, of a ball that gets, than our, our left sides would hit. And obviously, Clay couldn't do things with the ball at, at, at such a height and with such a energy that very few people in the whole world could do. So we never wanted to get around to his area. We wanted to threaten as much the middle of the court and uh, the, the, the if you go back one, John, the, the great thing I love about this picture is the middle there, Gustavo, is actually read blocking because he's waiting for Lambert there, uh, Mike Lambert, who's actually going, looks like he's maybe approaching or going for a pipe. Um, that, for us, was such an effective play. And when we say effective is uh, the times that we ran it, uh, we scored, we terminated the ball at, at a very high level without adding a lot of errors. And that obviously has, it's a very complicated uh, play that I think teams see in the international games that they try to replicate at club and high school levels. But uh, yeah, we wanted to threaten as much as we could out of the middle of the court at a very uh, high rate of speed out of the setter's hands. And obviously having Loy was, was always a huge advantage for that. Well, we, let's see here. I've got a little bit different slideshow than Oh, that, hmm, interesting. Um, <laughs> what I was looking for was, uh, right now, Heath was asking, where do you tell high school uh, kids to contact the ball? Uh, are we talking hand contact? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, boy, and I, you know, I don't mean to diminish the question, but when we're talking in high school, the ability for those kids who actually consistently hit the ball in the same location off their hand uh, at a high uh, rate of repeatability is, it's just, the skill is pretty high. And there's so many other factors that uh, when I'm trying to interact with teams or coaches or young players, I try to drive that there's a lot of other things that before they hit the ball, I'd like to watch so many other kind of attributes of, um, uh, what it takes kind of to be an effective hitter, all these little steps that culminate in being in the right position and being able to put your hand uh, on top of the ball. I mean, if we're talking contact-wise, um, you know, normally we want to drive the ball uh, almost in that, in that last picture, I guess, if you show it, kind of almost like you were trying to palm it from the backside and driving uh, the ball to areas of the court right there. You can kind of see, um, you know, putting the ball and creating angles kind of with it depends if you're hitting it right at the center of the ball to the left to the right of it but um, you know it's a there's a lot of factors that are happening up before your actually hand hits the ball that I, I'd love you know I really think that are important aspects to it you know I'm gonna um, help you maybe here too Heath and that is when Tom and Clay hit the ball, the science that we've done at the USOC, the contact time in spiking on the ball is 0 .008 thousandth of a second to one hundredth of a second. And then their hand is no longer on the ball. So Peter Vint and I have a, a myth talk about the myth of wrist snap. And that's because of what Tom's trying to explain to you right now, that when he hits, the contact time, what he's trying to do is hit the sphere for that hundredth of a second at the place that's right for him at that exact set and only that set. Um, so this contact time that you're seeing is, re even though you see his wrist perhaps snapping and things, the time on the ball is only a hundredth of a second, and you, you don't impart wrist spin or wrist snap in a hundredth of a second of contact. You see the wrist come over, but that's hitting the sphere is what 
is making him be such a good hitter in the right spot. So what about off-speed stuff? Because we've got some off-speed shots here. <laughs> yes, that would be uh, at off-speed. And, you know, the, the, uh, the biggest thing I would say if we were watching a video or this was a analyzing myself on film uh, when I was with the team is I most likely would say if we rewound this, I guarantee I was up later than uh, I would want to be. And the reason that the ball is lower, that my arm is kind of down and uh, my arm is dropped, it's not as extended as I was in the other pictures, I would almost guarantee that um, this was because I was later in getting to a position and, and providing a nice clear window delivery area for uh, my setter to see in this in this picture. Uh, the other incredible thing in this picture is if you look at the background, I think that's Reed back there. He's actually, I'm in the air getting the ball and he's about to leave the I'm ground. Sorry. Yeah, and if you you see the tempo mm -hmm. that our offense was running, yeah, in the background. Uh, but obviously I think as middles it was very important if, you know, we can see this guy here, uh, I believe it's the middle from Venezuela, if a middle decided to commit in, uh, on, on a middle, what we would say is you have to have the awareness not to just unload on the ball right into this guy. And this guy, I think he was about 6'10", touched 12 feet, so he could get over the net. Um, and if you felt someone jumping on you, which happens quite often in international volleyball, we would constantly try to um, uh, get our guys to realize it's not the worst thing in the world to tip the ball and put them, think of, I'm trying to put them in a very uncomfortable or awkward situation to produce a very difficult chance for them to transition against us. Normally, uh, the longer plays went on, the, the larger the advantage we had uh, for a particular point could be we were uh, extremely uh, diligent in our ability to transition and, and be uh, patient in our wait for the window to actually take a full-blown swing. And so here, though I'm ex probably extremely late, that's why the ball's not being delivered, right? Um, if a guy jumps on you, you get kids to know, you know what, you don't have to hit all the time. What you're thinking of over time, I'm not creating errors. I'm not just blasting into a block. Yeah, excellent point, excellent point. Um, and then another little off-speed here, which is definitely better time better timed and a good delivery and obviously this is the middle from France and he's actually a, a, a very uh, well-known blocker um, you can see he's got great form of, pe of uh, piking and getting over the net and I I would say in this situation I made the right choice and knowing that he probably cut off an angle maybe read my approach uh, of where I wanted to uh, you know get on the ball earlier and as I saw him closing off that area my thought was the best thing I should do is tip right over the block, which um, uh, guys who played against me, I wasn't afraid to do. I, I never was, uh, I was one to utilize it and, and know that all I cared about was being successful at the point. I didn't mind if what it looked like or if it was hard or soft or <laughs> uh, tipping right behind the guy. I wanted to play the game as hard as possible. So. Um, yep. This is your best Robin Williams imitation that I've ever seen you do. <laughs> Boy, John, do you not have Photoshop over there or something? <laughs> you can't help me out? Jeez, embarrassing. <laughs> that's called hitting, that's called not great range for myself, uh, hitting pretty much right through the, the, the meat of the block. Uh, and it looks like I got lucky that it's going to rattle through and go for a kill maybe right yeah. behind him. So. Not the best, uh, not the best choice by me. I should have had more range. Obviously, you can see I have a lot of cutback available. Uh, you know, going back to my left. All right, I think it's time to do some blocking talking. So tell us about blocking, and then we've got a couple questions. Um, the first sure. one's coming, and actually, uh, I'll you you talk, and then I'll uh, answer this one for Chris afterwards. Sure, sure. Um, blocking, in my view, is one of the most difficult uh, things that uh, skills that both an individual and a team concept can build. And it's probably, boy, I, I, 
I don't know the numbers on it, but it, it's the skill that you repeat over and over that you probably have the least success rate at actually getting what we call blocking, getting a, a stuff block or a point block. You, you do a lot of other blocking moves that we try to, or coach and staff, and uh, would put certain statistics around and how many quality touches did you get? How many times were you at the point of attack that we used as other criteria besides did the ball hit into your hand and then smash to the ground? And over time, you know, international players, and I'll use Ryan because uh, Ryan and actually David Lee are probably two of the top blockers in the world uh, over such a long period. Their ability to be great blockers was starts with their vision. When you watch these guys play, uh, they are incredible at the amount of information that they're taking in from uh, where the ball was served, what rotation they were in, uh, who are the most likely, you know, what happened in the last rotation, what do the hitters do, what do they like to do. You know, they're processing everything before the ball actually gets delivered and making, uh, let's say, educated choices of, where should I be going? And, and you know, I, I use this terminology. The great blockers are usually reading the play before it happens. You know, they they're not necessarily uh, watching the ball directly out of the hand. If you watch Ryan and David, they're in the most part reading these this whole situation of the team and the setter, giving all these visual clues, uh, cues, and then uh, making the correct read over long periods of time. Um, and so for me, as I said before with hitting, vision is a, like the pre, premier eminent initial skill that I, I watch for kids uh, when they start to learn blocking, when they say, how do I be a better blocker? Well, what are you watching is the first question I like to ask kids. And if they're watching the ball uh, during a lot of the process as the serve's coming over, they're going to have a very, very hard time blocking the ball. So you really need to watch the players, and, and you know we, we use a cue, ball setter, ball hitter, which uh, as the ball comes off a setter's arms, you, you're you focused on it just for a fraction to know when it comes off, let's say, one of our outside hitter's arms on an initial pass, you are on the ball for a fraction of a second, and you know exactly if you close your eyes, you'd say, I know the ball is going to land on this X on the court and at this timing. And your eyes immediately, you'll see David and Ryan, the other great blockers in the world, their eyes will immediately lock on to the setter. And I, when I mean lock on, I mean they lock on because everything about where the ball is going to be going, setters have certain cues that they will tell you, whether it's body position, hand position, if they're taking the ball in front of their head, uh, head, behind their head, on top of their head. Uh, there's so many cues that you can get picked up. So it goes from watching the ball off the setter's arm to staring at the setter to as soon as the ball gets delivered, knowing where did the ball go. Is it a left side play? Is it a middle play? And then you'll also see great blockers immediately drop from uh, the ball as it gets set and really lock onto a hitter. Because as any great blocker will know, if a hitter is going to go hit the ball, they will tell you if the ball is really high, really low, outside, inside. If you lock on to them, I can guarantee you one thing. They're going to get their feet to the ball, and, and if you watch them, they'll tell you everything you need to know on how to block them. Well, that brings up a couple questions that have come in. The first one from uh, Malaysia is um, when moving side to side to perform a three-person block or a two-person block, footwork of sidestep or cross-step is normally used. So that's a question. Do you, do you, uh, you know, slide-step or do you uh, cross over? Yeah, that's a, uh, 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 in, on a three-man block, was it, John? A three or a two. He's probably wondering, do you do anything different between a three and a two? Yeah, you know, uh, another interesting concept that uh, Hugh and a lot of the other coaches on the national team were uh, introduced and kind of drove into us is uh, putting yourself in the situation, and they constantly ask, was that in system or was that out of system? So we as blockers knew that if I was a middle in system, that I would be extremely stressed uh, because I knew that the ball was in a, a good location, 
it was passed in a good location with good timing that I would, if it was going out to the pins, that I would be stressed for time to get myself in an area next to my outside blockers. Uh, things changed drastically when we as a team viewed a play as being out of system. And obviously that um, ability for the team to read the same play over hours and hours and, and thousands and thousands of reps is, is why we would train uh, all that time together is that we, when we saw a play develop, and we're talking over you know, seconds or a fraction of a second, we all read and reacted the same way as blockers. We knew that uh, if it was an out-of-system play, uh, we could potentially three-man block on almost anything. And we did that for the ability that we knew if we three-man block, we were highly successful in uh, either getting a quality touch in a transition or uh, creating a point, an error, uh, from the ability to get three people in front of someone that created uh, a different mindset for hitters. Um, there's traditionally maybe two types, to make it simple, two types of, of movements. As a middle, you want to do like a three-step movement, which is uh, would be to cover long distances at a very uh, short amount of time. As an outside hitter, if I was uh, left or right side, I could use potentially a shuffle step, which would be would not involve any type of crossover footwork. Um, but even more and more now today, the ability to be extremely what we call like dynamic usually involves um, a crossover type move almost on every type of block move. You can generate much more energy and cover more ground and get over the net more by doing kind of a, a all players, middles, outside, doing a, a three-step uh, a three-step crossover move. John, was that clear? I know you, you've yeah, no, put, I think it, that's put it in. No, that's all, this is all fantastic stuff. So, um, Jason asks, at a junior's level, if the blocker is late and leaving a large hole, is it better to block and take away a sharper cut angle or drop off and cover the tip or roll? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and at the junior level, obviously, there's, there is some point where what is too late, obviously. If they're already hitting, do you want a kid to – are they going to do any type of add value by uh, getting a block? being, you know, a second late after a hit, obviously that answer is no. But for young kids, I would really reinforce the fact that uh, that they are never too late. They have to always, if they make a false move or they commit in the middle, that we said you can't stop. You have to keep going. You have to keep working to try to get to the point of attack. And maybe uh, a nice characteristic that you can drive into young kids is, to build the awareness that if they are late and you ask them, were you late on that one and did you reach is a nice kind of series of questions because uh, the good middles and Ryan and David were excellent at it that if middles were late, maybe they we say they got juked, they're arriving very late to the point of attack, that they had the ability to just get up and over the net in great positions that if the hitter did happen to hit their hands, good things would happen. They would either get a quality touch or the ball would go absolutely straight down and get a block. Now, if they did some crazy things uh, like reaching way outside their body line, trying to fill what we say like a seam or a gap or a hole in a block, normally there is a very low chance of success from this type of action. And what we really tried to instill, um, and obviously I actually had a very hard time with this, uh, for many years uh, is not the ability not to reach and guys like myself who are long and you know long levers you, you really have to get them to understand it doesn't pay it doesn't it's not successful and that's, that's maybe a great picture to kind of show I'm actually reaching probably too much towards clay and as you can see if I was if you pulled myself to be more square to the net and reach straight over the net that is what we, uh, our coaches, would constantly instill in us. And for some odd reason, if this guy, it looks like he's going down the line at, at Clay there, if he happened to hit in my hands, there were a lot of areas of my hands that would produce a good touch or even a block in this situation. 
you know, I, I wouldn't produce a good touch. I couldn't get a good read for my defensive guys sitting behind me. Um, like I said, if I would just go straight over the net and get over, if he happened to hit me, it would produce a good a good outcome for us. So um, getting square to the net and over at any time is an absolutely critical thing to just keep working on kids. And just I wouldn't advocate a pull off and, and cover a tip unless uh, they are enormously late. The last thing they want them to do is just standing in the middle. You know, they want them trying. You want to try to get kids move to the point of attack, and, and especially for blocking, just get them off the ground and get them square to the net and up and over. Great. Um, long, or this is just sort of a classic question here from Jason. Uh, traditional blocking versus swing blocking technique. More teams in club and high school are using them, but they aren't quick enough to be effective. What should we teach? Um, you know, I am a, I am normally when you introduce any type of skill into the game and, and blocking, like I said, has a, it's probably one of the, the least successful skills you do on a court over a period of time at any part of the game, at any skill level. You're just, for the most part, you just don't get a lot of blocks for how many times you actually do the blocking uh, skill. Um, going to that, um, when you're introducing a skill, if you can remove a lot of the moving parts associated with like a swing block, I think that's the best way to get kids used to you know, if I'm watching someone block, I stand on the other side of the court from them, and I make sure their eyes are locked onto the ball, then the setter, then the hitter. You know, you really watch: are they tracking the right things? Are they um, are they analyzing the right uh, clues or cues from the other team to make them put them in the in the right situation? Um, the the younger they are, I would remove as much moving parts as possible and make the movement as simple and uh, uh, repeatable as often. Uh, as kids get a little bigger and stronger, uh, the ability to do a swing block is, you know, imperative to be successful on the international level. You just can't be uh, dynamic enough to uh, hang with the, the likes of uh, guys at the international level like uh, that can be done without swing blocking. You can't cover the ground fast enough to take away certain areas. Um, but it's a, it's skill like anything that you have to develop into. Um, you know, you you don't start off with hitting lightning fast goes to the antenna. Uh, it's you know you could, but it'll take you three years to become a proficient hitter. You start out with removing a lot of the uh, factors around the hitting. So just remove as much of the moving parts associated with blocking, make sure their eyes, their body position, their feet, their footwork is uh, efficient. Yeah, so my two cents to that is includes the fact that as coach, probably this is the only skill where you need, your voice becomes a really important feedback point, which is they don't touch the ball, but they may have put up a perfect block forcing the hitter to hit out, to hit down the line, to tip, do something that they didn't want to do. And younger kids don't know that because they only think block equals stuff or block equals touch. And it's really important for you as the teacher or coach on the court to get excited when they do a great block even though they don't touch the ball. I mean, I, I played in Italy long ago and, and I remember coming down from an entire uh, match didn't touch a ball the entire match, and my uh, def defensive specialists and, and the setter both came up and said, that was fantastic blocking. Uh -huh. But, you know, I just took away their favorite shot, and these guys didn't hit what they like to hit, and I never touched the ball. So the coach's feedback is important there. And Heath then asked, what's the best blocking drill at the high school or junior club level, would you think? Um, I... I, uh, myself, my opinion to blocking drills, I really um, think that progression type blocking drills are really important for kids. It's, it's, and in that sense, I would literally just a setter with a left side and right side hitter starting out, not even hitting in system, just high balls and having three blockers just react to uh, uh, very readable, not having the ball maybe even on the net, having that have the setter run out to the ball and delivering a ball to the left side, 
to the right side and making sure this is an area that uh, the kids have to react to at a very, very high success rate. There should be no reason that they're going to be um, uh, you know, stressed by the speed at which the ball is going to be delivered to the hitter. There should be enough uh, time uh, removed because the center of movement or the balls may be delivered from a coach you know, from a ball that's out of system so the kids can react really high success. And then what I mean by progress, progressing is then you start to incorporate maybe a, 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 a more of an in-system ball. You start to incorporate uh, possibly another a middle hitter then to it. So there's three options available. And then obviously um, you know, from our team, we would start to progress into a middle, a pipe hitter, and then you know, kind of a full offensive rhythm all in perfect ball offense. So you get the kids used to uh, mechanically running through certain situations repetitively over time and making sure, hey, did you read that? I, I, did you see the setter? Did you see how he didn't get his feet around there? He, he gave me a really strong tell very early before he even had his hands on the ball. I knew he was going left. And sure enough, you turn around and your whole team is saying the same thing. We all saw it. We all reacted the same way. The more you can push that ability from an out-of-system ball to an in-system ball and, and the ability to have all the guys react as one unit with an in-system full offense is the nirvana for you know blocking systems at, at the international level. Yeah, uh, that's uh, very well said. So personal question, did you ever train on the national team uh, on a box and block hitters standing on a box? You know, we've when you've played as long as myself, uh, you, you've def definitely done one facet of uh, the ability to train. I never really, uh, and some people do uh, live by uh, training blocking on a box. I never got a lot out of it. Um, I think you're just, again, I go back to you're removing too many of the important factors that lead up to what happens when I have the ability to get my hands over the net and before the guy hits the ball, there's so many other things that happen that a box kind of make remove some of that. I would maybe use a box for if uh, a certain player was uh, very proficient or efficient at uh, getting their feet and getting to the point of attack and they're in the correct position but their hand position wasn't correct. Maybe they were reaching straight up or their arms were wide. And so you wanted them to repeat some action of this is what it feels like to get my hands over the net quickly. And, you know, you blast the ball into them. Or, so in that sense, I think a box can be, a box can be an, a, an effective tool. But to leverage it a lot from the training aspects, I think it removes a lot of the, the key parts, the key indicators that, uh, that lead to uh, great blockers. It removes too many of those uh, characteristics. Well, I hope. I um, hope everybody heard that. I, I, uh, I've i never taught my son or myself, I've never stood on a box for one minute because of what I think Tom just said. I, I thought one of your best statements about how to be a great blocker is that you said it starts with where the, you know, where the ball was served from. <laughs> I don't think people, most people think that that actually is part of being a great read blocker. And yet, you're right, That's and that's not done standing on a box at any point in time. It's the whole game. But Bernie does have a kind of interesting question. Isn't it true that the objective one for the blocker is to take away a specific area on the court? What do you think about that question? Uh, I guess let me repeat that. Uh, the number one objective of blockers is to take away um, an area of the court. I would say if the number one objective of a blocking uh, system is to lower the overall uh, kill efficiency of a team, hitting efficiency. That is, in my opinion, the number one overriding, uh, if you're going to put it on one statistic, if you got 10 blocks, but um, if you got 10 blocks in a game, that may be a good blocking game, but every other ball that they touch was a kill, that to me doesn't seem like that's an effective way uh, to judge blocking. So for me, if the team consistently uh, had a low hitting percentage, that to me is, you know, the nirvana of great blocking systems. Now, 
when you consistently do that over time, you're putting consistent pressure in hitters and teams and offensive uh, offenses uh, certainly tend to cripple in times of uh, you know critical moments when you're they're constantly feel like they have two or three guys on them, um, and so obviously with consistent blocking strategies and, and systems in place, uh, blocking tends to go kind of in, in, in my opinion, it goes in like uh, streaks. Uh, it, it happens when you put a lot of pressure on team, maybe you get a server, they're feeling uh, a lot of pressure to side out in certain rotations. Uh, and the number one guy I, I would point to is David Lee from the national team that I play with. This guy was freakishly um, uh, streakish with the amount and the ability for him to get blocks in a row. And I mean, he disrupted matches immensely with his ability to feel like he was all over a setter or a particular hitter or a particular offense. I mean, it was actually incredible. And that's probably not learned from a box. <laughs> you know, I never saw I, I never saw David uh, out of box. No, <laughs> he 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 had an incredible vision. Uh, you know, his eyes, he was watching and digesting all the information that he saw on the other side of the net. Uh, he was well-versed in what the team liked to do. Um, great footwork, great handwork. So um, great kind of cues to lead into a, uh, a great blocker. So Shane's wondering what you think the best approach is for blocking a one-step or a no-step. Should the outside blockers concentrate on turning into the court to block? Um, let's go with the first one, a no-step or a one-step uh, blocking move. Um, now, the, the reason, you know, this is, I guess, from a, a beginning standpoint, again, when you're teaching kids to block, uh, if I'm standing in one area um, and not moving, I think it really hampers the ability for kids to look. And all I want kids to do is if if I say, hey, block me right now, I don't even have a ball, and all I do is stare at them, and I approach on the other side of the net. But I make really drastic um, approach angle differences. So I approach maybe right in the middle of the court, then I approach six feet away, and I want the kids to get a, a, a sense of they have to stare at me to pick up where I'm going to be going. And so you kind of get their vision of uh, or a, a key to blocking is just opening up their eyes to be watching the information. Once you see that they're doing that, obviously, you start to let them see from the setting standpoint that they're, they have to watch a setter. That is the most – they're going to tell you exactly where the ball is going. Now, if you're not taking a step laterally along the net, uh, as the hitters – and, boy, we had a lot of great hitters on the team that I've ever played with – uh, if you're standing in one spot for more than t a second or two, a hitter sees you and picks up where, what area of the court you're going to be blocking in well before he's got off the ground. So as a hitter, you use your peripheral vision to see, wow, this guy is com this blocker has positioned himself and left me four feet of line. And by the way, he's not moving. He's not changing his position on the net. Um, that is a, a fairly easy um, – a fairly easy person to deal with from a hitting standpoint because they never change their location on the net. The difficult thing, and that's why swim blocking, one of the keys that people, a lot of people may not realize, when you cover ground laterally along the net and then take off from one area and get over, when you do that at the last possible second before a hitter hits the ball, that is when you have, you know, you can create your largest advantage because once a hitter hits, once they've chosen maybe a particular shot, great hitters have the ability to take the last possible seconds before their hand hits the ball to choose where they want to hit. But normally, you'll see some kids locked in on an area and they go for it. Well, good blockers will be reading all this and at the last second be getting in that, changing their area of the court that they're taking away. Um, so stationary is good for youth development, understanding the concepts of, I'm getting over the net. I'm square to the net. Uh, as you progress as a as a player, you definitely want them to feel the ability to move along the net and still incorporate staying square, getting their uh, getting their hands well over the net at the right point uh, contact. Excellent.
excellent stuff. Um, you know, we're, we want to learn a little bit more about you, so uh, we're going to get off of skills for a little bit, and then we can get back to that. And, Tom, I know that, uh, you know, you've got a family and a lot of stuff, and we're going to learn a little bit more about that. For those of you that don't know uh, why, when I saw Tom this fall, he was kind enough to come to my daughter's volleyball match, and I offered him a, a coloring book, and he said, I, I can't go back without 52 coloring books or something like that. <laughs> Oh, we yeah. ripped through those color books. By the way, they loved them. But <laughs> appreciate those. These they are volleyball, volleyball specific, coloring. volleyball specific coloring books. You guys, you can download them online too. Um, so you were in open gym, and you kind of talked a little bit about that, and I think uh, how you picked volleyball um, over other sports. Is there anything you wanted to add about? Did you were you did you play other sports before you chose volleyball? Were you like a soccer kid and a hockey kid, or? Yeah, you know, uh, let me just add one thing before we kind of get back into this. I would be more than happy to uh, go still into the volleyball chat at a later time. Obviously, you can afford any questions to John, and I'd be more than happy to interact with everybody out there. I, I love it. I, the game's been a tremendous uh, experience to me. It's amazing that my, my playing days on the national team and the Olympic teams um, are over. It was literally a 20-year a journey for me that uh, uh, went by in the blink of an eye. I loved every minute of it. I still enjoy the game um, and the ability to give back to the game that's been so plentiful and open up so many incredible opportunities and relationships to me. Um, fire off any questions. I'd be more than happy to uh, satisfy all the all I'll people, make sure uh, that every you audience. get you get everybody's email. For sure. I'll let you, Absolutely. you know, sort of uh, make that offer that way. So that's good. So did you play sure. other sports? Yeah, you know, uh, I played soccer when I was younger. Uh, in, in watching kids who start the game and have a particular success rate at it, for me, you know, eyes on tracking the ball, obviously, and then court movement is the two premier skills uh, that I really uh, pick up on and try to enhance because I know if they – kids can do those two things, uh, it's an incredible ability for them to be successful, like kind of a court awareness. And you, you, it's hard to be able to know where you are on the court or where I should be if you're not watching where the, what the ball is doing on the other side. Um, and going to that point, kids who play soccer, who are uh, a sport where they're constantly moving with their feet, positioning themselves, seem to me to have a, a, a nice uh, head start on other athletes. I, I just, I'm a really big believer in um, young kids uh, getting introduced into soccer. I think it's a great ability that we don't uh, interact as much. Um, obviously, you can play volleyball as young as you want. For for my kids, it's it's hard to find you know five, six year olds who want to play volleyball. So playing soccer incorporates a ton of uh, footwork uh, to be successful, and I think it's a nice transition into uh, volleyball. Sweet. Um, the metal oh, the side. Skateboarder too. I don't think it, I don't. I can't draw any parallel between skateboarding. I could ollie <laughs> real high and do some crazy bonelesses, but uh, no parallel to volleyball. All right. What about mental training? You know, the what percent of the game is mental? Ninety percent. How much do you train mentally? Five percent. You know that kind of canyon that we've got to bridge. Yeah, boy. You know, for me. Um, I put a huge um, uh, importance on the, the mental aspect of the game and uh, taking that a little bit further, you know, the ability to, to drag information or intelligence that you could glean from preparing yourself before you actually step on the court I think was a huge differentiator. Like I said, um, myself, 6'8", uh, 215, I could touch, you know, 11, 9. Uh, that on the world stage is like a cookie-cutter cookie type build. There is nothing that scares people about that. Um, there's a lot of guys out there who can do that. That's the differentiator is uh, how, what kind of volleyball intelligence can you bring to yourself and then expound onto your team to drive uh, success. And uh, 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 I guess going to the mental aspect, I just always uh, had a natural tendency to um, – in critical moments, maybe in practice, in matches, in competition, to really remove myself from uh, what 
I was doing or what I was competing for or the importance of points. And I was going back to all I got to do is approach. I'm in rotation six, so I got to get off the sideline here. This guy, sir, I, I went through a lot of things that put me, we, we call it in the moment. And, you know, it's easier to see with young kids when they, you see that they're out of the moment because they're very flustered. You, they start to react in, in manners and behaviors that are not typical of maybe their skill level. And obviously um, that gets much more difficult to kind of read as you get into the higher level uh, until you start to throw um, by the way you're playing uh, for the Olympic berth uh, coming up here. And it's two points. It's 13 all um, in the fifth game. And the person, the team that wins these next two points gets to earn the right for their country to go to the Olympics. And then going through that scenario a couple times, it's really easy uh, to go into training and say, you know what, we were going to be in these incredibly pressure-filled scenarios that you can't even replicate um, in a practice facility. We have to put so much emphasis on what's the task at hand. What do I do? I have to do for the team to be successful. And uh, we were, my teammates and I, were incredibly successful at removing what we were doing, what we were playing for and the ability to say, what do we have to do right now in this certain rotation with a certain server um, to be successful? So, um, you know, I did it kind of at an early age. I really put it upon our guys, too. I said, look, we've been in this situation many times. You know, uh, if we were siding out in a certain rotation, here's what we need to, you know, mind you, we could have been aced three times in a row or uh, not successful in siding out. We are, you know, at, at this rate at siding out. This is what this guy's served the last three times. Here's what it's going to probably look like. Here's what we should do. Get our minds on not what ha happened in the past because you can't change it. What do we have to do right now to be successful was a thing I, uh, I kind of always brought upon myself and my teammates. You know, you, you guys lived through that. I mean, I sometimes show in my clinics the 15-13 win to go to Athens over Cuba, and I you believe you're in Puerto Rico uh, for the match itself, but that that moment occurred um, for you to get to Athens. Mm -hmm. And you played. Yeah, it's a, yeah, and actually we were down in that match. We were, like, oh, I think we were down eight to four. I think at the at the side switch, um, and we were down. I think two one. Uh, you know, we made a nice comeback to in the fourth, and just you know, it's very hard to tell players, hey, this is you know, we do as basketball all the time. Last second shot, here it goes in. I'm throwing it from half court. What I would tell our guys is, normally we're going to be in a situation that is absolutely imperative for us to accomplish our dreams and goals as players and as a team. It's not going to involve me or you or someone diving over a bench or, you know, cat doing a somersault crazy dig, it's going to involve uh, doing a simple action that we've done millions of times over and over and keeping that pressure and the ability to do it many more times than the other team and keep that pressure on them is what's going to actually occur. It's not going to be some crazy play where you have to play a ball at the wall, a ceiling, or uh, it's going to be a quite common play that we're going to have to execute in order for us to uh, accomplish our dreams and our goals. And uh, I can't tell you how many times it was a simple touch that turned into a transition. Uh, it was not some miraculous rundown where a guy was in the stands, you know. Um, so simple plays over time at a really, really high success are, are huge keys to being successful, not some miraculous plays. All right. People want to know about the coach that impacted you the most or why, and and uh, we've got it up on the screen here. It, you know, any thoughts you want to add to this as we go through the stuff you've already given to us? Yeah, obviously, um, echoing and shorten that statement, uh, I've had a lot of great coaches who have impacted me both as a player, as a leader, uh, as a captain, as a, a teammate. Um, both you know at the club, high school, college level, all have very special places in, in my uh, maturity as a player and um, what's important that I brought to my 
to the guys on, on the team I played for. Uh, I just think, um, you know, and obviously going through that experience the last four years with Hugh, uh, there's a tremendous bond that I have with him that, that I hold that's very special um, uh, w than any other coach I had. But if I had to choose a guy who really affected not only myself and my teammates, kind of that core group of guys, um, was the, the training and the, the work, the, uh, you know, the, the blood, sweat, and tears, not only from the physical aspect, but just from the pure mental aspect that we were uh, mentally tougher, we were physically tougher, we knew we pushed ourselves to the absolute limit as uh, individuals and then both as a team throughout uh, the time that I spent with, uh, with Doug as our coach. Um, there's many stories of, um, of him as a coach with the, with the uh, older guys when I was just a young guy and I was listening to their stories. Um, and, and people told us that Doug even softened up on us as, as, a, a, as a team uh, later on in, in the 2000s. And I couldn't imagine that because just the sheer intensity of every play that we executed and practiced prepared us uh, many years down the road for eventual where we, we, did, we put all this effort and energy to the test uh, to compete for a gold medal. And obviously I think that core group of guys uh, built a, a absolute fantastic foundation of incredible confidence in that we could do these things, these actions, that we uh, were extremely confident in each other as individuals and as a team that uh, we've done the work over the years to be successful and obviously we had the terrific opportunity to prove it as a team in 2008. You know, I can see why you're a uh, captain. Um, let's go back to your roots, uh, dad and mom. <laughs> and I'll just a summary of what you've written here, a little insights beyond what you've shared so that we can see it on the screen. How did they support you all the way through Beijing? Yeah, you know, um, it's interesting. It, going through the journey, um, I think, uh, in the pursuit to be the best at what you do in any profession, and, and for me it was uh, a professional volleyball player to be an Olympic volleyball player to walk among uh, the team's, you know, world's best, requires an incredible amount of uh, very selfish acts along the way. And uh, that obviously starts off when you're extremely young and your parents uh, support and get you over to gyms and get you over to open gyms and then club teams and practice. And, uh, and for myself, you know, it pretty much turned on my parents that one day I didn't know volleyball and the next day I was like manic. I used that word manacle uh, and that was the only kind of way that described it. I couldn't get enough of the game. I wanted to watch it. I, for three hours, I'd come home and watch video of myself in slow-mo in the basement. Um, I was crazy in the ability that I wanted to digest you know, not only playing and competing against the best players I could, but also reading and watching. Um, and I made, along the way, myself and my teammates, you make a lot of uh, selfish choices. And, and I think our parents bear that biggest burden when we're younger. Uh, and obviously, as you get older, you start to say, by the way, i, I got to go live over in Russia or Japan or Brazil uh, for seven months of the year, which is part of being a national team uh, Olympic volleyball player. So you start to make all these choices add up over the time. And boy, after the 20-year journey through Beijing was done for me, I finally uh, had the wherewithal to, to ask my dad, what was it like? Because every time I was always putting volleyball first, volleyball first. And uh, my parents have uh, raised us in a great family environment, and they're all still in and around Chicago area. And they, I was the only one that kind of left at 17. I never really looked back. And you know, my dad said something that was extremely touching that I, I reach out to and I explain to kids and especially to parents. You know, my dad said I could see the passion of what you were pursuing in your life that I couldn't, he couldn't quite relate to it because he didn't, he played a little bit of volleyball, but he couldn't relate to it in that sense. Uh, but he knew from the energy and the excitement and the love of what I was pursuing would only produce great things, great opportunities uh, for me in my life. And whether that was, you know, 
I don't know if he ever imagined uh, an Olympic gold medal. I sure as heck I believed it and envisioned it. But uh, I think as a parent, as a parent of five daughters myself, young kids, the biggest thing I want for them is to really latch onto something and have a passion of zest for life and to go after it with uh, this manical pursuit, uh, whether that's being an artist, a lawyer, uh, uh, education, or uh, obviously a professional volleyball player, I can have a, add a lot of a background to it. But he said if you, just seeing that passion for it, um, you know, you knew you had to support it as a parent. That's what you want for your kids. And I thought it was just a, a great thing to pass along to parents. Sweet. Um, best advice? And how did you get over bad stuff? So I think your best advice is pretty well summar summarized, and you've been pretty consistent through this whole, whole uh, wonderful webinar because you're right. That is that journey. Um, and the same thing for getting over bad stuff. Yeah, I would, you know, with the uh, focus on the journey, boy, you can use that in so many little ways, as granular as I use it on learning a skill. It's very easy. I can bring in someone who does not know volleyball to coach someone if you want to coach on was the ball in or out, and I can say that's not good or that was bad. Uh, a true coach and a teacher and someone who can uh, make change, positive changes in someone to learn this game is the ability to read a lot of the actions that happen before the end result. And, you know, a lot of people can call in or out. That's not what great coaches do. Great coaches give set kids up to be successful over periods of time over and over and over. So whether or not the ball was in or out by two inches is shouldn't be the focus even from the youngest to the oldest. What were all the things they were watching? What was their body position? What was their court awareness? Were they calling for the ball? Were, you know, were they communicating? There's all these things that we as uh, people like, you know, the passion for me now is uh, uh, allowing kids to be introduced to this game that's, uh, uh, somewhat technical in nature, and there's not a lot of people who are well versed or in the ability to coach it. But if you can really break down all these spots and, and not worry about that end result, I think it's a, a huge boon for for us as being people who want to introduce the game to more people at a grassroots level. You know, you uh, probably haven't read this part of my blog, um, but I'm going to give you some. Uh, some science and some facts that you can use to help us grow the game, Tom, and that is in with the touch being a hundredth of a second for a spike and five hundredths for a pass and a tenth of a second for a set, I use the data volley stuff to figure out you guys average 17 touches on, a t on your team from the start to the end of the Beijing Olympics. And when you do all the math, you, Tom Hoff, average touching the ball from the start of the Olympic Games until the end of the Olympic Games in competition, not in practice, a total of 27.4 seconds. Amazing. That's how long your skin was on the ball. The rest of the time for those <laughs> two weeks, you were not touching the ball in competition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's an amazing statistic. I, I'd love to hear it. And uh, definitely to relay that to kids that there's so many other things to focus on. I think is a, a great point. I love that statistic. Thanks, John. Yeah. So high performance development, you kind of say, uh, because you're a little earlier in the pipeline before now, this is a good answer, we think. Honest to the, for sure. Yeah, boy, I, I remember going to this, uh, this, my first international tournament, and uh, we actually were playing Mexico, and they had two outside hitters who were uh, ran X twos and X fours, and myself as a as a young middle from Chicago that was playing co-ed league was not used to seeing these guys, and these guys were pretty lively in the ability for them to change direction and bounce around. And uh, I remember specifically, I remember the gym, you know, open walls, and these guys tore me apart and tore our team apart, and I I couldn't believe it. And I remember thinking, boy, we've if I want to accomplish this, this uh, 
dream with my teammates and I, you know, to end this. End this is a uh, gold medalist. We've got a lot of work to do that we just got spanked down by uh, Mexico. So uh, obviously, remain grounded is an important aspect of uh, uh, working hard over the years for for young kids playing the game. I like this question, and I love the story. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this thing will live uh, in infamy with me. Yeah, uh, a long one of the many, many international flights we were on. It's probably four in the morning local time, and being six eight in uh, an athlete, you're not real comfortable on flights. I was I happened to be watching Man in the Iron Mask, and I think a couple people saw me, and they mentioned it at practice the next day, and all of a sudden I was the guy who. Uh, loved Leo DiCaprio in The Man in the Iron Mask was my favorite movie. And so, oh, <laughs> throughout my career, obviously, these are some of the, the great memories that I have of, uh, obviously, being successful and in, in winning a gold medal is, is paramount. But some of the little things in interacting with the team and the guys over the many, many years of spending so much time together uh, bring back just a terrific flood of emotions and feelings. <laughs> when I come home from practice, I saw I think I saw a life size cut out of Leo, <laughs> and I didn't know why the whole team was. You know, I thought we had a meeting or something. They wanted to talk to me, and sure enough, everyone had a good laugh at it. And, uh, it was pretty funny. I had a lot of Leo stuff in my uh, over my career from the guys. It's pretty funny. And music, you've got five daughters. <laughs> yeah, this is a uh, a this is my my new team that I have assembled. I have uh, five beautiful uh, daughters who are uh, right now they are eight, six, four, and twin two year olds. So and all girls. So um, music. When we say favorite music or songs, you know some of the maybe hard rock or uh, that I used to listen to back in uh, my single or pre kid days. Obviously, are, have gone to. Uh, some Disney tunes and Taylor Swift is fairly <laughs> popular in the house, and um, the, my my girls love dancing, and especially in the morning, I love getting up early with them and getting them uh, breakfast and acting goofy with them in the morning. It sets my it sets me up for a, a fantastic day. So we do some crazy things with dancing in the morning. Hopefully, so did you? I'm glad no you, one's got a flip video or YouTube up of me yet. <laughs> did, did you do any uh, music listening in prep? for matches or practice or anything? Was there any favorite songs there? Yeah, you know, I wasn't, there are some guys who, and I'm all for whatever you need to be successful, John, if you wanted to put headphones on and shades on and sit in the locker room, that was fine. For me, yeah. I wanted to talk to the guys. I wanted to understand how they were feeling. I wanted to, anybody wanted to talk, you know, what rotations we wanted to try to line up, you know, talk with uh, the coaches, the staff. Um, I was more of a talking type guy uh, than a pure kind of zone out, quiet guy. And that was obviously what I could add to the team. It was not conducive or effective for me to be kind of a, a, a more quiet guy. Uh, yeah. I had to get a, get a good vibe of the team. I have a sense as to why you're going to be such a good parent and teacher and coach because we say a lot that the kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care and you know as a captain when you're spending your free time getting to know your the rest of your players even that much more that's uh shows how good you are at this what what about books yeah you know i, I used to read uh these clive Cussler, which is he's uh he's like a underwater adventure guy um, uh, that was kind of my uh, foray into uh, the nonfiction world. And then uh, the other side of that was the, um, I was always kind of fascinated, like I said, kind of empowering your mind and, and putting stuff out there because I had these very strong visions when I was fairly young of uh, putting stuff out there in my mind that eventually came true almost to the point where it startled me. And I really believed it over time that, uh, if we could put these things in writing, let the universe know about it. I was a very firm believer, uh, and obviously uh, Hugh was a huge person who believes in this. That I believe that's one of our strong connections is 
that ability to put things in your mind that they will eventually come true if you take a lot of those steps and work and persistence and determination along the way with and live what you're, uh, if you want to be the best in the world, well, that takes a lot of work and dedication every single day to live up to. And it's really easy to hold each other more accountable when you vocalize that over and over. So um, I was a, a big proponent of that. Love reading books on that. Well said. So you had 20 years of doing this. Um, favorite memory? Any more insights? Because, you know, we are recording this, everybody, so others that weren't fortunate enough to listen to all these great things get a chance. So anything you want to embellish on this? Both. Uh, yeah, just uh, I, I literally, you know, everyone says the gold medal point or you know, celebrating with the gold medal. I mean, really, it was, it's the culmination of all these uh, events and experiences and relationships and all this time that you built up with, uh, you know, not only the guys who played with us, because there were guys who didn't make the team. Uh, there were guys who were on our staff, our coaches that uh, necessarily weren't on the official staff that came to the gym and came into so many people's lives that affected players. There was so many family and friends uh, you know, who uh, dealt with all these acts that uh, for you to say you want to be the best in the world and, and, and walk that walk as a team that you're going to have to make, people are going to have to help you along the way. While we've had incredible uh, support from teammates to staff to USA Volleyball to the USOC that over time just this incredible amount of people that um, they unfortunately only hand out 12 medals. but. I mean, I love to show the medal and in, in not for myself as a gold medalist. I want to show people about the journey that myself and my teammates uh, were privy to experience this thing over time. And, and it actually is a 20-year journey that went by in a blink of an eye. And uh, just happy to, to share that with as many people as I can. And John, do really appreciate um, the ability to do it again on this webinar. and. Uh, would love to follow up with anybody with any additional questions. I'm always into the volleyball chat. Any type of questions, I'll love to uh, uh, feel for you guys. So, yeah, I've uh, already sent you two. Um, okay. And to that end, that means that it all started because you'll be a better hitter if you set. Obviously, that worked. <laughs> you know, I don't know what that last. Um, sentence actually says about the area that I grew up in, and I was actually a pretty good setter in my area. It took me a while to move into a hitter. I had to actually recruit one of my buddies and be like, oh, I bet you you're going to love this position. You want to be a setter. I, I knew I didn't have a future in setting, but, uh, you know, I, it's a great position for kids to learn. I, uh, I encourage as many kids to be introduced to that skill set as much as possible. There's so many other things that uh, if you can look at it from that, obviously I, I had a very brief run-in with that position, but uh, <laughs> the more the more exposure you can get to the different positions in the game, the better. So, and so when we move on to club, you kind of sh shared that. So why don't you talk about this last college game? That's that's very uh, insightful too. I think for those that are seeking to be come the best they can be. Yeah, you know, um, before. Uh, our team won in 2008. You know that's obviously a great uh, moniker that uh, my teammates and I get to carry around for the rest of our lives. No one can take it away from us. Um, but before that, uh, we've had uh, some incredible um, setbacks and disappointments. And uh, one we didn't touch on in this, you know, when we went to the uh, Sydney Olympics, we were ranked third in the world, and we ended up not winning a match during that whole Olympics. And obviously. That was an incredible disappointment, um, and the reason that I almost ranked my college uh, in before that is because I really truly understood the finite ability of time was against you as an athlete. Always, there's always this big clock ticking down that um, you know the big man above has granted me this ability, um, this special ability to uh, play the sport with a bunch of great people, um, and. You never knew when that uh, that that clock was going to ring out, and you had to really maximize that time because in college it is this finite window. And uh, you know, going to that, I was a 
what you would say a well decorated, accomplished, um, awarded player. But I don't care about it. I didn't care about it. I give everything up in a second um, to be successful as a team, and that crushed me as a player, and it completely revamped my thinking as 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 a player and how I reacted and how I took upon. Uh, training and my ability to really affect others around me. Um, uh, I was my senior year. Uh, I was a good player and I could do a lot of things that a lot of players couldn't. But uh, the one thing I did not do, I did not take advantage, is really incorporate the ability for me to affect my teammates. And uh, that was a devastating, crushing loss for me uh, in college. That that really changed my mindset over uh, the rest of my career. Wow. So that adds up to 12, right? A non-prime number that is, uh, <laughs> that is, that is uh, also not odd. <laughs> yeah, for some reason I've been a freaky numbers guy my whole life. Um, uh, when they asked for jerseys over USA, obviously 12 was available. Um, I, I always enjoyed the number 12. I don't, know, I don't even know how to, how to explain it, but... Uh, I could not have a prime or odd number for sure. Every time I went overseas, if they had it, um, I would, you know, beg for them to give me something else. So I, I don't know why that is. It's just kind of a freaky thing that a lot of kids think that's pretty funny to hear. Well, I like it. Although my, I always honor my hero, Kurt Kilgore, um, being a lefty. So I always wore 13 to in his honor since he couldn't play after he broke his neck in 1975 that was that's why I do prime and odd <laughs> <laughs> well obviously he great player my, my great friend uh, Clay Stanley was 13 and he, he was a the non he didn't care about numbers but he always knew my uh, distaste for 13 and he'd always mess with me <laughs> I rubbed his jersey up or throwing his jersey on my chair so I'd be like Clay are you kidding me what are you doing keep that thing away from me so uh, we all had fun in the end so a little bit more of uh you know this alone stuff I think you've done a the really good job covering it but so why don't we jump to the uh bland meals what's your pre pre-match meal a little bit of nutrition uh yeah you know I for the most part uh, bland is in rice pasta you know some sort of uh um, meal that wouldn't upset my stomach. It wasn't like a really rich or fattening. Uh, usually I went with just chicken. I really looked at uh, food, um, unfortunately, as, as nearly fuel for what I wanted to do on the court. And I looked at it as uh, how long could this get me And I knew that I didn't want to you know, eat too much and I always had kind of food and uh, resources of fuel. Uh, for me during matches, I was always a guy who was carrying bars and asking the trainer uh, Brock. Aaron Brock uh, was uh, always made fun of me. I constantly had food, you know, uh, to keep that steady stream of energy kind of throughout the match. So, but other guys are different. You know, some guys uh, can eat pretty much whatever they want before matches. I just feel like it's a nice precedent to set for kids. You know. Uh, Something that's going to be bland is usually a very safe bet for consistency over time. Athletes' routines are everything. You know, and the more of a routine you can get in, uh, whether it's before you get on the court, uh, I think it's it's it sets you up for success uh, when you're performing. So that kind of leads us to this one, and then we have one final slide to talk about physical training. Um, Brushing your yeah, you know, I had <laughs> yeah superstitions or uh, these rituals. I had a lot of kind of odd things, and I guess a couple of things I always did. I always brushed my teeth and kind of showered before I went to the match. Uh, I just almost looked at it as I was preparing myself to play. Obviously, along with you know going back in time, then you go to nap, you go to lunch, you go to you know a servant pass in the morning. You did a bunch of things, but. The things that my teammates always looked at me like, what are you doing brushing your teeth before you leave for the match? I always wanted to, and it kind of you know, alerted my, my senses that I was getting prepared to perform again uh, and play and, and doing the same thing over and over every day I think is a, a, obviously a great thing for uh, athletes to do. And you like playing overseas in Greece, huh? Yeah, I mean, uh, 
I, I really enjoyed a lot of the places. I, I loved playing in Japan. Uh, Greece was actually a pretty special place in my heart based on the fact that I uh, had some kids, uh, young kids, while I was over there. And the culture and the people were just incredibly uh, uh, inviting to their culture and uh, you know, to raise kids over there was fantastic. I, I absolutely loved it and have uh, incredibly fond memories of uh, the people and my young kids uh, being raised over there in, in Thessaloniki, Greece. So, oh, great cool. times. All right, well, let's uh, close out, and then there will be the Q&A at the end here. Tom, um, just some thoughts of, to you about both physical training and, you know, we have here at the uh, OTC, the Recovery Center, I think mm -hmm. not enough coaches and players think about getting enough rest and and I know that I was I thought that you added that to your regime you know by getting more of you to be willing to take naps and you know we actually say at the Olympic Training Center uh, with the, all the athletes is that Americans have to train really hard there's really not no such thing as overtraining what Americans never do is get enough rest and so what are your thoughts on all this physical training and rest yeah, that's actually a great point. I think the studies have shown that that's a, actually a, a pretty nice uh, data point that we can communicate to our not only young players but obviously coaches uh, that feel that more is always better. Um, you know, for me, the biggest kind of overlay that I feel like uh, you want to view external training outside of the actual volleyball sense or the the nutrition or the sleeping and rest attributes, all you're doing is you're allowing your body to be able to, let's say, um, be on the court more. You know, when, when we had guys and they wanted to lift, you know, the biggest thing I would question is, are you lifting so you can train at a higher level for longer levels at a sustained intensity that normally you couldn't because your body was not strong enough? You know, there is a point over time when we would train in practice that we knew, boy, we went three hours full bore at a, a terrific intensity that we knew if we could do this for three hours, we will never be in a situation where we can we have to play for this long with rally scoring. We knew that we could play at the intensity for that long. We could we could uh, persevere energy levels and the ability to concentrate uh, for you know whatever our longest matches were two and a half hours. So you, and you built that up as almost a like confidence. We've been here before. Even though we may feel tired, we've done this before. We've been through, you know, equally demanding ta uh, taxing physical practices. It gives you kind of a, a great confidence, a, a foundation that you can look at each other and, know you, and say, we've been through this and some more. You know, we've been through another hour, and all we got is another 15 points we're going to play here. Um, so a thing I'd like to point out is just, the ability to train and do all these really have to point to how do you sustain a higher level intensity training, which volleyball to me is really all about. The game is very difficult to train at at anything less than 100% speed. Uh, you, It's a game that starts and stops, but if you can go for two hours at full intensity over those two hours as an individual and then collectively as a team, you're going to produce wonderful, wonderful games that will result in being successful on the court. Wow, that is, I, I love your analogy there. It, it does need to be played at full speed, and, you know, even if you're 12, it, it has to be played at the speed of you and your 12-year-olds because that's how the game is going to happen, you know. It's like Marv always says, train in reality. Yep. So. Yeah. I mean, it, in the other... The only caveat to that is when you're introducing a new skill to get the muscle memory up to speed is you can remove a lot of the other factors in speed and the ability to perform an action and repeat it slower in a more mechanized environment where it's just maybe you in the net with a player where they can do it in a slower movement. But obviously you always want to try to transition that into a full game-like environment where they have all these other factors kind of influencing them. Um, and obviously for me, if the, the second part, good exercises, I firmly believe active warm-up. You know, I, sitting on the ground and stretching, to me, I never saw a direct correlation with reduced injuries with that for me and my teammates. I just thought 
the ability to wake your body and your mind up that as soon as the whistle starts, you have to move at 100% speed. So the more you can incorporate that in your warm-up, the more you get your body used to kind of a regimented uh, awakening process. Yeah, that's really well said. That's what we call the recess rule, where you go from two hours of sitting at your desk and the bell rings and you go, boom, at high speed. And they don't come in saying, oh, oh God, I pulled a muscle. I bet none of your five daughters have said, oh, oh I pulled a muscle, Dad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but scientifically, 326 studies by the Center for Disease Control um, found no, no stretching, dynamic, you know, sitting on the ground, the traditional stretching and things like that did, uh, did any reduction of uh, injury, not one. In fact, 18 of them they found reduced performance, which is not what you want to do. So. Hey, this has been beyond awesome. Um, we do have a couple more questions, and then I'll let the other ones uh, come to you by email because I'll pass along. Sure. You know, so you can say thanks to these guys. I'll give everybody that attended your email address, sure. not yours, but you'll get their email address. Um, from Malaysia again, Hak Leong Chu says, as team captain, has Tom ever encountered any disagreement within the team? How would you step in and resolve the problem? Well, that never happened, I'm sure. They never. <laughs> Let's go back to that. So I was a captain of a team that was a large group of highly, highly successful, uh, uber-confident uh, athletes that were uh, confident at various levels throughout the career. We had disagreements all the time and every time. And I actually thought it, as long as the conversations and the dialogue was not destructive, uh, it was increasing. It was increasingly therapeutic uh, and, and beneficial to our team to resolve grievances, uh, you know, face to face, whether it's on the court. The only thing, and, and by the way, I as guilty as everyone throughout time. I, I had Riley step in, you know, or Hugh mention, or you know. But you, what you, we tried to prevent at, at all costs was uh, destructive um, behaviors or comments or discussions that went on amongst players. I mean, that was the biggest thing that really um, broke down uh, hours and days and weeks and, and years of relationship building to know that um, people knew I would depend on, I would do my job no matter what at this time. I didn't care about uh, if I look like a superstar, if uh, my agent was watching, if my parents, my girlfriend, my TV was going to sponsor, all I was concerned about was being successful for the team. And we drove that into myself and our teammates and from the staff, from the guys. Uh, and if once you get that buy-in, it is an incredible incredible enriching moment to feel a team that is completely bought into uh, this this idea of, of one goal and how do we achieve it and obviously there's going to be disagreements on the way there are, those, those are all healthy conversations that need to be had and some of them and unfortunately involve a little yelling and disagreements but uh, you got to get them out there you got to have the tough conversations all the time we had them uh, you know Tom I've been coaching this game for 40 plus years and I've got to say the last couple hours with you have been two of the most valuable hours in decades because to know that you're a dad of five girls I mean I have this funny feeling that you know with the son playing at Princeton and a daughter playing in college over at Bowdoin that another 15 years from now we're going to have several Hoff jerseys if the genetics weren't right playing for the uh, the US team given the, the dad that they're going to be raised by so I can't say enough um, about the, the stuff, thoughts you've been sharing tonight it's been fantastic and it is part of this where Olympic journeys began with you know USA Volleyball and the Olympic Committee and God what a great ambassador for our sport we're going to have in you for the next 20 or 30 years or 40 years or 50 <laughs> I'm glad you're coaching, oh, I, and I'm glad you've got five daughters because there's going to be five great kids out there. Yeah, I, well, John, I, I really appreciate. Obviously, uh, in closing, this game has been uh, incredible. 
incredibly rewarding not only to myself but also to uh, my teammates over the years and uh, gold medal or not I've, I've had incredible opportunities and relationships and people that have supported that you know weren't in that nice picture that was us at 2008 and uh, I really find uh, it's I, I hate to use the word duty but it it is I feel that I, I have to give back to this game and I, I really uh, feel fantastic with the ability to reach out to people and, and explain a little bit about the journey that myself and my teammates uh, went through uh, before that picture in 2008 was snapped. Yeah. All right. Well, let's close with this one. What a great family you do have. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I can't say enough. Uh, this has been fantastic. And to all the attendees, you can find this probably posted in a few days up onto the USA Volleyball website under videos. Um, you can download it or you can watch it, move it to any part that you might have missed or want to repeat. I know that I'm going to be doing that because there's a couple of times that Tom's insights, I want to hear it again. And I'm going to pass this along to my teams and, and tell them where to watch it and watch it in their own time when they have time and, you know, not just tonight. Um, but I can't say enough on behalf of USA Volleyball and the Sports Development and Region Department that you know what you're doing for us is is hugely appreciated. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate it. And obviously, thanks. To, big thanks again. I've said many thanks over my years uh, to USA Volleyball. But uh, you know, I wouldn't be on this webinar. I wouldn't be uh, have that opportunity to interact with so many uh, young kids and, and be able to get back to the game. It wasn't for uh, the opportunities, uh, you know, posed to me uh, by USA Volleyball. So appreciate it. No, always a, a pleasure to get back. Uh, feel free to send me those questions. Always up for the volley chat. So thank you very much. Right. Uh, do appreciate it, John. Take it easy out there. And we are going to archive this, and we'll let you know. We'll send the uh, link to everybody that took the webinar tonight. Sounds good. All right. Hang in there. Thanks, John. Best of the family. Bye. Take care, everybody.